Is that fast? Yes. Uh, I have to tell you that whatever we do not eat will have to be thrown away. So please help yourselves to some snacks and cookies. Doggy bags. <laughs> Okay. Should be safe. We're good. Thank you, Bob. It's okay. Okay. Not not for court again. Well, I'm getting wet. It's morning. It's about tonight. Okay. Good evening, Kalisperasis. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. As I, As I mentioned, mentioned, this is our first in-person event after the pandemic, and we're really excited to be back here and see each other face to face uh, after almost two years of uh, Zoom meeting and meetings and Zoom classes and Zoom lectures. We're all zoomed out, so I, I hope that's the end of it. So uh, I'm very happy to see all of you here. At the same time, I am uh, sad to, uh, to announce that the honoree, Professor Diane Tuliatos, in whose honor this lecture series has been endowed, passed away just a few weeks ago in Florida. Diane has been a, a major figure here at Amsel, both in her own department of music, her specialty was Byzantine music, and also in Greek studies. And for those of you who remember the history of the professorship, you will remember that she was instrumental in establishing the endowment fund for this professorship almost 30 years ago. Uh, she retired uh, about five years ago, and then she moved to Florida, and unfortunately, we, uh, we lost her just a couple of weeks ago. Um, when she retired, her family endowed this lecture series, and this is actually the seventh Diane Turiatos lecture in Greek historical studies. And today's lecture will be given by Professor Apostolidis. Before I talk to you about the speaker of the lecture, let me just mention that we will have a, an event to honor Diane's memory. It happened very fast, so there was no time to organize something. So in the next uh, few months, I will organize an event uh, to honor her and her accomplishments. So stay tuned for that. Also, um, during the pandemic, we lost uh, Nick Caracas. Nick was, of course, a driving force behind the professorship and the support of Greek studies in our area, and we will honor his memory and his contribution separately as well. Today, this event, the first in our lecture series for 20, the academic year 2022-2023. 
Professor Constantine, or Standis, as he's better known, Apostolidis, is a major figure in historical and classic studies in Greece. He studied classical philology and Greek and Roman history, and then he went on to become one of the most prolific researchers. And he's the kind of person who does not rely on other people's research, but really digs into the sources and examines each and every detail and each and every minute piece of information that the sources give us to reconstruct the big picture. So he's one of those people who has the rare ability to produce both analytical research and also synthesis for the wider for the wider public. Uh, his long list of books uh, focus on Greek history of the of antiquity, especially the history of Alexander the Great and his successors. Uh, these books have been have received multiple awards, most notably by the Greek Academy of Arts and Sciences several times, and also by the Society of Greek Writers and so forth. Uh, he's also worked on ancient Greek texts. His most recent book is a critical edition of Socrates's, uh, pardon me, Plato's Apology of Socrates, uh, which is already one of the top in the list of top uh, top ten uh, sellers uh, in Greece, and also a number of other books uh, on uh, anything from Cavafy to uh, Greek tragedy. Professor Apostolidis has been teaching at one of the leading schools in Greece, the Ionius School, and it is truly an honor to welcome you to our university. We are very happy to have you here, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Let me just get into your slides. Here we are. Um, thank you. Okay. Dear Professor Cosmopoulos, uh, thank you for your kind introduction and for the invitation to deliver this lecture. It's a true pleasure for me to be in St. Louis, and I would like to thank also the Tuliatos family for their generosity and the Greek community for their support of the Greek professorship. Phyllis ke fili, yasas ke kalosas vrika. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander of Macedon is undoubtedly the most important figure of ancient Greek history, his name marking the beginning of a new era for Western civilization. Let me be a little bit find yeah, yes okay sorry to find the uh, can you can you hear well in the back yes. good he has been also the most inspiring personality for several centuries up to the present day among nations of different origin religion and culture all over the world. This is a medieval Iranian um, manuscript with Alexander the Great uh, inside a special carriage carried by four uh, birds, which carry him to the um, celestial dome. That means they, in a way, they try to show the, the man who um, painted this small painting in the ma manuscript, how he became a god. Here is a Byzantine manuscript in Venice, where Alexander is something like a Byzantine king, uh, with all the Byzantine way of dressing and all the people around him. So you can see that he got into the civilization in different periods and he was painted as their hero. Hellenism, through his achievements, was promoted to the borders of China, India, Arabia, and as far as the land of the Nile. Dozens of new cities were founded, 
the geographical and commercial and scientific horizons of the world literally expanded. Greek culture deeply and fruitfully affected many Eastern peoples, attracting them to a new, different way of life, while Greeks, the only civilized nation of Europe at that time, acquired the necessary vital space for their further development. Each era, however, has its own perception of historical figures, and the image bequeathed to us by ancient historiography is open to multiple interpretations. The idealistically created symbol of the hero, the great general, the far-sighted politician, or even the visionary of the unity of mankind. This is Andy Warhol's, one of the famous portraits of Alexander the Great, is strongly questioned and is often misrepresented as a degenerate homosexual, corrupt drunkard, or as an adventurous opportunist who fought his way through Asia, leading a herd of hungry wolves, or a ruthless slaughter of peoples, or finally, a man who conquered the world just to lose his own soul. They accused him of morbid distrust, which led him to the elimination of several loyal officers or even close friends, a real reign of terror, make him feel deeply in his skin the inevitable loneliness of power and occasionally regret it. But moral judgments are always easier and often more impressive than historical evaluation and painstaking documentation. Is there a possibility of an objective evaluation based on his deeds and both his realized and unrealized projects? What is the position and the dominant trends of historical research today? First of all, we must examine carefully his achievements in the military, political, religious, and cultural fields, and then move to an overall evaluation without prejudice and unaffected as much as possible by the judgment of our time. Alexander was born in 356 BC to Philip II, King of Macedon and Olympias. He was tutored by none other than Aristotle. And when Philip was assassinated in 336 BC, Alexander succeeded him to the throne. For the next 13 years until his death, in 323 BC, he mounted the most extraordinary military campaign in history, conquering most of Asia. Alexander's father, Philip II of Macedon, a very capable leader, had managed through his military skills to form a highly trained national army with the Macedonian phalanx as its main weapon, a dense battle disposition, 16 men deep, each of them holding a spear about six meters long, Sarisa was called, so that the spikes of the first five rows protruded at the front line and the rest were kept upright at an angle, preventing the enemy arrows from reaching their target. You see here the five rows that their spear protrude and at the back, all the others have a, on an angle their spears. Philip was also the first to organize a very sophisticated corps of engineers of sidecraft with catapults and other machinery which accompanied his army. Either by cunning diplomacy or by sheer force, he had managed to subjugate the barbarian landlords of the Northern Balkans. He defeated one by one the constantly discording and often fighting each other Greek city-states.
and finally crushed the Athenian democracy at the Battle of Heronia, 338 BC. Heronia is, I don't see the, do you see, no, uh, perhaps, yes, Heronia was somewhere there. Okay, and what you see, you have to understand, uh, I must explain this, that each city in ancient, Greek, in ancient Greece was a city-state. Their relation to, the, uh, any, uh, to any other city-state was like uh, today's states that Germany has other politics uh, than Italy or than Switzerland or than France. So each small town in Greece had its own regiment democracy or aristocracy or oligarchy or anything else, but they, we could, find, could f never find uh, a, a, a common way of uh, communicating. Uh, sorry. So, and finally, crushed the Athenian democracy at the Battle of Heronia, 338 BC, forcing them all to agree at the Congress of Corinth, Corinth there, exactly, to, to a joint campaign against the age-old enemy, the Persian Empire, who had been incessantly threatening Greeks for the previous 150 years. Dreams evaporated the day a bodyguard stabbed Philip II to death at the entrance of the theater at the Ye. The causes will never be known since the murderer was kill, killed on the spot. But how exactly Alexander come to power? We are in 336 BC and Alexander is just 20 years old. He ascended to the throne with no experience whatsoever in administration and he headed instantly to the north where rebellions were proclaimed since the recently subjugated subjugated Balkan nations believed that the death of the previous king would put an end to the Macedonian dominion. All the area in the north of Greece, today's Greece, was subjugated by Philip II. But when they heard that the king was dead, said, okay, let's go away, finished. Reaching as far north as the river Danube in modern day Romania, where no Greek had ever previously set foot, he pacificated the entire region by force of arms. Learning in the meantime that the main cities of southern Greece also rebelled, challenging anew his authority, he crossed Greece north to south, some 500 kilometers in less than a week. The news reached him at Prespa Lakes, and he made this road from Prespes to Thebes, okay, in one week with his army. Some 500 kilometers in less than a week and appeared in front of the city of Thebes. He besieged it, occupied and flattened it, setting an example. No one in Greece thought of ever again challenging the decision of this irresistibly impetuous youngster who insisted on his father's plans for the alliance and the expedition against Persia. Which were the means at his disposal for such a venture? The army with which, with which he aimed to face the most powerful empire in the East was 30,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and 160 allied ships strong. His financial reserves were very limited. Some 70 talents, about 14 million today's dollars, while others claimed that the Macedonian kingdom was already in default. On the other hand, during the last two centuries, the Persians had gradually conquered and annexed present-day Iraq, Egypt. So you see in modern geography, political geography, 
um, the Persians had gradually conquered and annexed present-day Iraq, Egypt, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey, Syria, and Phoenicia, present-day Israel, Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan. So here you see the Persian Empire with today's uh, states. On the other hand, during the last two centuries, oh no, sorry, they had an inexhaustible source of densely populated areas for recruitment at any moment. At least 400 ships of the Phoenician fleet at their disposal and trained military elephants from India. Their treasury, even after the capitulation, had more than 180,000 talents in bullion, some 2 billion, 2.16 billion dollars. Remember, the Macedonia had 14 million dollars, the Persian Empire had, had 2.16 billion dollars. An amount that should not surprise us since the total area of the Persian Empire was at least 40 times larger than that of the entire Greece at that time. Not only the Macedonian kingdom, but the entire Greece. Was such a campaign against Persia chimerical? Did really Alexander know where he was going from the beginning? Which was his exact course of action? To quote Napoleon's words, he who knows exactly where to go never goes too far. In 334 BC, Alexander crossed the Hellespont. So here is Hellespont, okay? There is the Macedonian kingdom, all the lands that he had subdued in Greece, okay? Up to the Danube River, river. I show them, I show you now. And he crosses the Hellespont, which is the border between Europe and Asia. Okay, and here you have the whole conquest and his march. In 334 BC, Alexander crossed the Hellespont, starting his Asian campaign and last, that lasted a whole decade. He would never see his homeland again, prevented by an unfortunate death by malaria in Babylon in 323 BC. By the time he had become the ruler of Asia, an area stretching from Greece to the Indus River. Indus River is some I can't find here, there, exactly. He had established a dominion that would flourish for over three centuries and leave an indelible mark in history. His first battle in Asia Minor was against the local commanders of Darius, who did not deign to move from his capital, Persepolis in present-day Iran, to face him. The two armies were almost equal in force, but the Persians had adopted a defensive formation steady at the bank of Granicus River. Over there is Granicus River, exactly after the Hellespont. And Alexander crushed them, unexpectedly crossing the current at the head of his cavalry in an oblique attack. Although risking his own life, he won a glorious victory at a minimum loss. He then followed a coastal march, driving away one by one the garrisons and the tyrants that the Persians had installed in all subjugated Greek cities favoring the restoration of democracy along his path. He continued coastal march. Oh, what happened? Okay. Coastal march. Okay. And in every city, he chased away the oligarchs and the tyrants, and he put on the, 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 the democracy something which is awkward because generally the kings were never had never good relations with the democrats they had always with the party which were either aristocrats aristocrats sorry 
for my English, uh, or uh, with the oligarchy. So he was above politics from the first moment. A king, a natural ally of oligarchy and tyranny, favored the power of the people for the sake of the joint effort of the Greeks. The second great battle was fought next year in 333 BC at the narrow passage from Turkey to Syria, today's Iskenderun, exactly there, where Darius was waiting for him, having brought with him four times as many troops, some 200,000 men as the Macedonians. However, Alexander also won this battle with a thunderous attack, leading his cavalry right in the center of the enemy line, where Darius was surrounded for protection by an elite corps of the so-called immortals. After a short but fierce engagement, panic was caused, the Persian king fled, and Alexander chased him several kilometers away from the field, although failing to arrest him. Back in the Persian campaign, the great King Darius shamefully abandoned his whole family and the considerable treasure. This is the famous mosaic from uh, Pompeii, uh, where the Battle of Issus is uh, presented with Alexander. Happily enough, he was saved by the destruction. You see him on the left and Darius, where the, the eye of, the, of Darius is uh, terrified against the Alexander who is fighting without a helmet. Alexander did not hesitate for a second. Instead of heading to the center of Persia, he decided to conclude the occupation of coastline of the Eastern Mediterranean and Egypt ensuring maritime connection with his bases in Greece. The strongest resistance was met in Tyre. Let me go back a bit. Yes, Tyre was there, exactly. And instead of, when he, he had his battle at Issus, instead of going directly to the Persian capital, he went down all the coast, to Egypt. The strongest resistance was met in Tyre, an island off coast Lebanon, which was captured, captured after seven months of obstinate siege by sea and land, since Alexander filled with earth the narrow stretch of sea between the sandy beach and the island, changing the landscape forever since. Now Tyre is in the mainland. Egypt, on the contrary, surrendered willingly, for the Persians had punished it so harshly when they conquered it that the Egyptians hailed Alexander as their liberator. In Syria, in Jerusalem, and Egypt, he respected the local sanctuaries, the customs and the religion of each nation, while in Egypt he was proclaimed pharaoh and was recognized as the son of Ammon. You see here a coin of Alexander the Great. Uh, it's after his death, the mint, but you can easily see the horns, which, was, which were the symbol of Ammon Ra, the Egyptian god. So his face here is Alexander, but he has these small horns around his ear. Uh, he was uh, recognized as the son of Ammon by the age-old priesthood. Before leaving, he designed with Kor a desert sand beach. The sorry, before leaving, he designed with Kor on a desert sand beach the foundations of a city which was to become the most important beacon of culture and trade of the southeastern Mediterranean, with a mixed population of Egyptians, Greeks, and Jews that soon surpassed Athens in number of citizens. A new metropolis, the first 
first of a long series of Alexandrias all along his march. This is the plan of Alexandria, the modern Alexandria from Google Maps, and the yellows are where the ports that he had constructed so the whole city could be a great center of uh, trade. The young king was become, becoming a legend. From man, he started looking like a god. The road to the Persian capital was open at last. What once appeared to be totally unreal could now become true. The Persian Empire seemed to be shaken. The next crucial battle was fought in the north of present-day Iraq at Gaugamela, October 331 BC. Again, the map, Gaugamela is exactly there. Where Darius gathered once again an innumerable army along with 15 elephants and some 200 scythe chariots, chariots equipped with sickles on their wheels. But this time he chose an open plain in order to annihilate the Macedonians. Parmenion, the senior and most experienced staff officer, advised Alexander to attack under the cover of darkness in order to surprise the enemy at night. Alexander, however, aimed at the psychological crushing of the opponent rather than leaving him with the slightest margin of doubt that he was defeated by cunning and not by bravery. He answered, I don't steal the victory. A famous answer, I want it mine, I don't steal it and rushed in daylight. The tactical plan was the same. Attack at the center of the Persian line, followed by his trustworthy Macedonian cavalry with such a vehemence that the Persian front broke and terrified Darius fled once again. Now, Babylon, Persepolis and Susa all three capitals, winter capitals and summer capitals, which were in ancient Babylonia and there the borders of the, of the mountains. So Babylon, Persepolis and Susa with their immeasurable treasures were at hand. Here you see how a famous French uh, painter, Lebrun, uh, imagined Alexander entering Babylon. Uh, Lebrun was uh, painting at the time of uh, uh, Louis XIV, the famous uh, French uh, king. And at that time, Alexander the Great was a prototype of how could one conquer the whole world. So the Persian army no longer existed to intercept him. And Darius was desperately running away with a small group of commanders around him, hoping to save his own life and preserve the crown hidden somewhere in the depths of Asia. Alexander took up the pursuit. If he could not capture him, he would never be able to overthrow the ultimate Persian authority. Ten months later, after continuous long and exhausting rides through the wilderness, Darius was caught at the outskirts of present-day Tehran, yet not alive. Here we see a manuscript. Again, uh, it's from uh, a famous uh, Iranian um, uh, poem, Shahnameh. It's of the 12th century. Um, of our era, it's Alexander comforting dying Darius. Of course, it's an imaginary uh, painting of the manuscript. We never know if he embraced, uh, Alexander embraced Darius or kissed him before death, but that's how the Eastern civilizations saw Alexander the Great. 
He was found just murdered by a nobleman who coveted the crown for himself and headed with the remnants of the army to the northeastern realm of the old empire at a mountainous route region of Afghanistan. Alexander did not cease to chase the new claimant to the borders of China, where the assassin was also delivered to him in chains by his comrades and sent to be tried for high treason and the murder of his former king and master. At last, Alexander was the sole legitimate heir of the Persian throne. He spent two more years fighting the rebellious tribes that defended fiercely their territory and strongholds. Seeking peace and stability, he founded many new Alexandrias in strategic points, populating them with a mixture of natives and Macedonian veterans or invalids, and endowing them with strong walls, paved streets, theaters, gyms, markets, luxurious administrative buildings, and temples for both Greek and local deities, widely, att widely attested by excavations of foreign archaeological missions during the last decade of the 20th century. Here you see Ai Hanum. Uh, uh, it was excavated by the uh, French uh, archaeological uh, mission. Uh, here is the Kokcha River, which uh, is the border between uh, Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Here is the triangular shape of the ancient city all around with uh, walls. And on the right for a photo is the uh, administrative center, the palace, as the archaeologists uh, called them, okay, in the center of the city. Where these Greek cities? Here we see a temple uh, uh, on the left, okay, it's a temple that doesn't look like a Greek temple, doesn't have the correct characteristics of the Greek temples, but it, it's exactly in the middle of the town that Alexander founded. And on the right, you see famous pavements, pieces of pavement from the building, the palace, which are exactly Macedonian and with Greek way of mosaic. Here you can see a glimpse of the river on the left, the river, and the walls. And on the right, whoever has been in Greece would have seen that in every old house there are some akrokerama, as we call them in Greek. Okay, the last, uh, uh, I don't know the word keramidi, uh, tile. Yes, the last tile of this Greek house has this exactly same shape. Here is a, a, a Greek philosopher whose statue was found in uh, Ai Hanum. We don't know which exactly Alexandria was, but we know that this was a harm stele. That means it was showing in every street, the Greeks were putting a stele, uh, milestone. a milestone, yes, uh, generally with the, with the, the head of her, Hermes. Uh, but here we have milestone, with the head of a philosopher. We don't know who he is, but his toga, which is, you can see it, means that he was a philosopher. Iliakoro um, Lois, solar... Bravo, sundial, bravo, bravo. Thank you. <laughs> sundial, Greek sundial. And on the right, you can see a piece of papyrus, which was found in uh, Ai Hanum, and it was on the papyrus, it was written a piece of an Aristotelic treatise. We recognize that it was Aristotelian, the, the words and the meanings. We don't know from which work of Aristoteles, but it was found in Ai Hanum in Afghanistan. Someone brought with him a book of Aristoteles in Afghanistan, in this city. So I don't 
Do I have something else? No. Okay. Then we are again. Afghanistan, uh, I can um, just to show you, is somewhere there. He transformed a large number of rural societies to urban ones with proper laws and regulations. He had to reconcile the Greeks and the barbarians, victors and vanquished, and convince them to live together and prosper through cooperation in a new type of commonwealth that no man had ever imagined before, except some weird philosophers preaching cosmopolitanism with the words one life, one world. But these were just dreams of philosophers and he made it true. In spring of 326 BC, he planned a new expedition further to the east towards India. He crossed the Indus River, defeated King Porus. Here is again the battle, Alexander facing Porus, okay? But it's just the imagination of the French painter uh, who opposed uh, with him with 200 war elephants and forced him to submission. He then handed him back the region he previously ruled, leaving him to reign further on as an ally. After eight years of campaign, exhausted by continuous fighting, the monsoon and the incessant rain, the army mutinied and refused to cross the fifth on the road tributary of Indus River. Even the most trusted generals advised Alexander not to proceed. He had no choice but to find the omens unfavorable. He yielded to the will of gods, erected 12 magnificent altars to honor them and took with heavy heart the road back. But if they had stopped him from going ahead, he wouldn't give them an easy return home. He ordered his army to build a huge river flotilla of more than 800 ships of various types where the lo he loaded men and horses, his army counting now more than 100,000 soldiers from various nations. And with two bodies marching along both banks, decided to explore the entire course of the river down to its estuary to the Indian Ocean, examine the coast there and determine whether it was navigable up to the Persian Gulf build harbors and marketplaces and in the same time subdue all riparian or coastal autonomous tribes. Here you can see that he started from the Indus all the river down. He went to the modern Karachi exactly at the estuary and then he divided his army Half of it passed through the desert of Makran, today desert Makran, totally inhabited, uninhabited. And the other half, he put it on the ships and they tried to determine whether it was navigable, this road. So in order to unite, unificate the Karachi harbor with the inside of the Persian Gulf. Both these two, uh, armies were met exactly there, the infantry and the, uh, uh, the army on the ships, and then they continued together up to the Persian capital. He fought fiercely with the natives, many of whom were primitives, conf confronted the desert under, under unbearable climatic conditions, hunger and thirst tortured his army. Nevertheless, after two years, despite terrible losses in manpower, he returned to the Persian capital, Susa. No one had ever crossed this barren stretch of land with an army before. Now, the question rises, 
What did he really do for his subjects apart from subjugating them to a new master? Okay, before they had the Persian Empire, the Persian king. Now they had the King Alexander. What did change for these populations all around Asia? That's the, the question that arises today to us. Naturally, this vast empire could not function by itself, and he realized that it was perhaps more difficult to organize peace than to make war. That's why, as soon as he came to the capital, he seized the reins of government, not tolerating any mistreatment of his subjects, and started punishing relentlessly either Macedonian or Persian commanders left in power who ignored his orders for justice and equity during his long absence, never indulging to the slightest abuse. Understanding that the kingdom could not be ruled, protected, or pacified only by the victors, he embodied 30,000 Easterners in his army, training them to cooperate with his Macedonian and Greek troops and granting them equal ranks. At the same time, he organized a luxurious feast with 9,000 guests during which more than 100 of his most trusted generals and officers, himself included, were married to girls of Asian aristocracy in order to procreate the future generation who would run both state and army henceforth. He also gave rich dowries to more than 10,000 Macedonian soldiers on the condition that they marry local women. Instead of listening to his teacher, the famous philosopher Aristotle, who advised Alexander categorically to treat, treat Greeks as a ruler and barbarians as a dynast, the former as friends, the latter as animals or plants. That's what Aristotle, the great Aristotle, said at that time. They didn't have the, this, this sensation, how can I say it, sorry for my English once again, that, okay, you can't just divide people and treat the ones as uh, persons, as, as a dynast, and the others as animals or plants. The great Aristotle, he decided to divide humans according to their skills and merits, not by color of skin or nationality. Of course, the above attitude caused a great deal of distress among the traditional Greeks who thought their privileges were violated by the defeated barbarians. Here begins Alexander's personal tragedy. The tragedy of increasing loneliness, of a growing impatience with those who could not understand or underestimated his far-sighted plans, which seemed as failures at the beginning, although they bore greater fruit than most men's success. But the great statesman had already prepared his countermeasures. He demanded that he be worshipped as God by all his subjects and that, that all his political decisions be respected as divine will. Was this due to a rel religious crisis of Asian origin pomposity, as he's accused of in recent times? Or was it rather sheer pragmatism? that dictated him this highly political action that set the precedent for the deification of all later Roman emperors who enforced their power through divine prestige. Anyway, he decreed, as God's will now, general amnesty for all exiles. That means King's former most obstinate political opponents, Democrats in their vast majority, and ordered their native cities 
to accept them back and re reinstate their once confiscated property so that peace and prosperity would prevail again in troubled Greek land and all the mercenaries left without job at the end of the war could now return to their long neglected fields or their crafts and stop being a cause of social upheavals. And he did not only influence mainland Green, Greece. He furthermore took special care for the lock of the local populations of the East by restoring the irrigation system in Babylonia, building new cities and trade centers, giving orders for, for the circumnavigation of the Arabian Peninsula, examining the possibility of the exploitation of pearl resources in the Bahrain island. Again here, apart from the, the orange okay, exploration, which near the uh, naval general of Alexander made, Alexander gave the order to three different officers to go and make the whole, the round of the whole Arabian Peninsula, three from this side and one from the other side. We know that he passed through the narrows here, but we don't know where exactly he, um, he reached. Sorry to find again. Uh, colonizing, colonizing the islands, uh, at the inlet of the Persian Gulf, to let today's Phylakah, it's a very small island exactly outside the Kuwait city. You see the city of Kuwait, and you see this small island now called Phylakah. Alexander baptized her Icarus. And you see here these two who. Uh, just in the Museum of Kuwait, they see a Greek inscription. And sending expert seamen to the Caspian Sea, sorry again, the Caspian Sea, he sent Patroclus, uh, an officer, to see if it was a lake or a sea, because at that time, Aristotle was saying that it was a lake, but they were not sure. And uh, the, the, the result was that Patroclus going up the Caspian Sea, at some point he couldn't continue and he turned back and he said that Caspian Sea was immense. And so from that time, we call it erroneously Caspian Sea. It's a lake, but this was not found, but at the, only on the 13th century by Arab explorers. Alexander made a mistake, and for 1,500 years after him, they continued uh, saying that it was Caspian Sea. He sent thousands of unknown species of tropical herbs and plants to his master Aristotle, along with a huge sum of money, some $150 million for scientific research. And not only that, he did everything in his hand for a true coexistence of Greeks and Asians, granting them community of culture. He affected the circulation of a uniform coinage, the adoption of common monetary standard, and established several mints all around his empire, facilitating thus the trade between Asia and the European Peninsula. The Greek language became the main means of communication from Egypt to India, attracting people to the treasures of Greek science, literature, and philosophy. Alexander succeeded in the Hellenization of the East, changing their way of life and paved the road for the Roman Empire to occupy Middle East nearly two centuries after the Greek dominion. At last, Christianity would not have been but an insignificant heresy confined in Israel if gospels, either written or translated in Greek, 
the lingua franca of that era, hadn't propagated the new religion to the ends of the inhabited world. Art and culture of dozens of nations in Egypt, Syria, Iran, India, or even China were influenced by the Greek spirit and craftsmanship, and the new products unknown to the East were imported from European lands and became trendy everyday commodities in the Middle East. You can see here on the left from Bactra, it's a town in modern Afghanistan, a little bit uh, northern from uh, uh, today Kabul, uh, a Greek sculpture. Okay, it's totally Greek, it was found in Afghanistan. On the right, it's an As Asoka inscription. Asoka was a king of 260 BC, that means nearly 50 years after the death of Alexander, Asoka was the great, uh, uh, how can I say, civilizer. civilizer of India, and he brought Buddhism in India. So he wrote on inscriptions, the new dogma of Buddhism, trying to persuade people to take Buddhism as a religion. In what language? Did he write in Indian? For whom to write? In Greek. He writes in Greek that I have uh, conquered India, I have civilized India, I have fought for many years, I have killed millions of people, and now I tell you that the true religion is Buddhism. You mustn't kill anybody, you mustn't kill uh, animals, etc., etc., etc. And he writes it in Greece. We have found at least three of these inscriptions, one in Kandahar, today's Afghanistan, and two others in the borders of Afghanistan, Pakistan. So the Indian king was, was forced to write as all the world now writes in English if he wants to be publicized. He doesn't write in Greek, okay, in Greek, he has just 10 million of readers. If he writes it in, uh, Dutch, he has 10 mi millions of readers. If he writes in English, he has the whole world. Here you see Gandhara art. These are pieces from the British Museum. Uh, Gandhara art was an art that flourished uh, in the border between Pakistan and India. We have found several panels. What we see is that they, they are Indian as craftsmanship, but the themes are Greek. You can see Hercules with his club and the lion, the lion of Nemea. You can see on the right, a horse on wheels. Who doesn't recognize the famous uh, Trojan horse? And we see Cassandra on the left, but with a if you see her, you believe it's an Indian woman with the breasts, with this, uh, cl the clothes. And um, besides her is Lao Khan, the famous figure who tries with a spear and it was the figure that said, don't trust ever the Greeks, don't trust them. And he tried with a spear the Trojan horse in order to make the Trojans listen that it was hollow. So the scene is totally Greek, but the art, is Indian. That means that the Indian craftsman loved the Greek themes of art and made a panel. It was a mixture of cultures and of civilizations in art. And you can see it. Okay. Uh, also, you can see that uh, the, some of the, uh, the panels of the Gandhara art, uh, men have beard, something unknown for Indian art. Here we see two statues. It is Faran and Damar. For sure, the names are not Greek. It's for the, they are from the fourth century AD in Yemen. In Yemen never set his foot Alexander. But even there, they wanted that their leaders to have a statue, a statue as the Greek as the Greeks did and made these two, okay, they're not good 
as sculptures, they are bronze statues, but they are from Yemen, 600, 700 years after the death of Alexander the Great. So, as William Woodthorpe Tarn wrote, Alexander was fortunate in his death. His fame could hardly have increased. No man since had possessed so unquestionably, unquestionably the strongest power upon earth. He had opened up a new world and did remain to be seen what he would do with it. When he died, his huge projects were just at the start, but from the small glimpse, the ancient testimonies allow us, we can understand that he was far ahead of his era, far beyond the brightest minds of his time. And though not free from flaws of character, he surely cannot be judged by common human standards. His legend still continues to inspire artists, literates, and historians through the unique paradigm, paradigms he set up in every field of his action. So if we can't state with certainty, certainty that he knew where he was heading when he started the expedition, we can confidently argue that all the measures he took in the end show that he was undoubtedly confident that he had come to stay. Or in other words, precisely because he did not know where he was heading, humanity managed to find his way. Now I reach the last paragraph. Now we know, you know the facts, but how about the man, the personality? Alexander has been, has been misrepresented in books and movies as a homosexual. And I ask, who cares what one does in one's bedroom? Some have, have accused him of being, of being a degenerate, incapable of action. But what kind of a degenerate would make his way to India by sword, suffering a dozen wounds from arrows, spears, clubs, and slings, all of which should be mentioned at the front of his body, facing the enemy and none in the back fleeing the battle. One who always chose to attack, never got into a defensive and never lost a single battle, never quit any of his sieges, of his most extravagant expeditions against the harshest of foes. Other historians, other historians think that he was a dependent on his domineering mother. But this is a man with two marriages and at least two children, one legal, one morganatic. If he could listen to us now, he surely would laugh with his, this description of himself. He has been accused of just following the plans and the advice of the highly experienced staff assigned by his father. But all his battle plans clearly show that it was his personal, fearless, surprising charge always against far larger armies that granted him his successes. Which general staff could plan the unplanned, the spontaneous, the impulsive fight to death for victory. <laughs> Alexander is said to be an unaccountable drunkard. But apart from the fact that in these remote areas of the Far East where clean water could scarcely be found and wine was the safest mean to quench your thirst without drinking water in order to avoid stomach problems, dysentery, or even lethal typhus, typhus, our experience from modern wars illustrates that high psychological stress often leads soldiers and officers to heavy addictions to alcohol or even drugs. Finally, some historians have contended that all his measures for peaceful coexistence of all people under his scepter with equal terms were just practically indispensable for the administration. And everyone in his position would have, sooner or later, been obligated to adopt them. And I will ask you here, how many emperors and conquerors after him didn't adopt such radical policies? 
How many great imperialistic powers, even in more recent times, did not succeed to adopt Alexander's open-minded perception and just disintegrated and disappeared in history? In conclusion, I hope that the above describe adept adequately Alexander's deeds and personality. Now your judgment may come closer to the tr truth if you keep in mind that great historical figures often create their own standards and that it is against those standards that they should be measured. Not the standards of minimalist historians who are lost in their ivory towers, disconnected from reality and pettily count and wait behind their desks. Thank you very much for your attention. It has really been a great pleasure and honor for me to be here among you, to reach out to you and to be able to transfer you the pathos and the ethos of an amazing historic figure. Yes. Thank you very much. Two quick things. Number one, what you've heard is not a product of reading other people, what other people have read. This is a product of years of research into the ancient sources. Every bit of information that you've heard, this is the product of original painstaking research, which makes even more valuable because Professor Apostolidis, you have shown that there's a lot of bias and a lot, a lot of prejudice where Alexander is concerned. A lot of, uh, a lot of it comes from Hollywood or uh, using our own standards. And he should not, Alexander should not be judged by the standards. Thank you for this. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Do we have any questions or comments for our speaker today? Go ahead. You mentioned that he made it as far as China. And yes. How, how far? What part of China did he get? He to didn't. Uh, he didn't enter China, but all of us, I believe, we know about this famous. Uh, um, now help me, please, uh, Debbie. Tobili Nostrato. Tobili Nostrato. The Terracotta Army with eleven thousand soldiers. What is very very intriguing in this um, archaeological uh, evidence is that each one of these terracotta soldiers is different. They have veins in their hands. They have different figures in their uh, face. The Chinese archaeologists now claim that this is an influence from Greek way of understanding human body that they didn't like to make the same and the same and the same. And they made casts for 11,000 different soldiers. Even for me, who I want to stay exactly on the point of what we have found. It was really very interesting to hear the Chinese colleague, okay, saying that this kind of craftsmanship must come from the Greek influence. Okay, so he didn't conquer China. No, he was exactly at the borders. If, if Alexander had died at such an early age, what do you think oh, his next what, steps would what be? What a nice dream would be that. <laughs> Already from ancient times, they were making, they were making such dreams. Would he have uh, gone uh, to West? Uh, would he have uh, conquered the, the whole of Europe at that time? Uh, we know that uh, there came... Uh, um, Presvestes, uh, Mr. Cosmopolis, ambassadors from Rome at that time, which was not a very significant, yes, it was still a small uh, city, nobody knows. But we are for sure that that's something uh, history now, historical research is sure of, that he had uh, already made a program for the, conquer, the conquest of the Arabian Peninsula up to the south. Furthermore, I can't tell you, but I, I many times at night I dream what he would have done if he had lived up to 70, not, not, not more than 70. Yes, please. Um, 
Um, Alexander the Great's um, usually compared to Genghis Khan. Um, his enemies would refer to him as a compared to Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, yeah. His enemies would call him a bloodthirsty conqueror. His supporters would call him a bringer of civilization. Is that a fair comparison? Of course, that's what I I told when when I I spoke about I said about. Uh, fought his way through Asia, leading a herd of hungry wolves. Okay, okay, change his hand. Attila made the same thing. Yes, but after Attila, everything vanished. After after change his hand, nothing stayed of uh, stayed in Asia Minor or in total of Asia, but just the bones of the dead. That's what. That's why I insisted so much that he he founded a new mixed culture. That's the point. We don't we don't admire Alexander because he killed. Yes, he killed, of course, some thousands of Persians. He killed some thousands of Indians. Poor guys, yes. But what did he leave afterwards? That's why I insisted so much in the culture, which we cannot force them to love the culture. We cannot force someone to go to the gym and feel like the Greeks may uh, love the, the gym, love the drama, the theater. If he doesn't want, no. He, he founded the cities and he made them live inside the cities and showed them the Greek way. And they loved the Greek way. They continued this way with the art I show you. Why to represent their leaders as Greek leaders? Because they like it. Like now in the modern world, everybody likes English music, American music, rock and roll. What what the, what what do we have the Greeks or someone in Turkey or someone in everywhere to listen to rock and roll? He likes the, the sound. He likes the music. That's it. If, if we take one last question and then for, our speaker will stay behind if you want to talk in person. Dr. Yes, please. When Alexander went down south to Egypt and then he built that fort, it's a two-part question. Was he going down to Egypt to get grain supplies? Was he making a port to transfer his ships, grain, to his soldiers as he went back up and into Port India? Did he have a big India. navy with his army that was close to shore? Yes, he had, of course, he had a necessity for concentrating his bases near to Greece. And Greece, because the sea was uniting every place of the coast, so he had a great need of supplies, of new soldiers. We know that he brought new soldiers in Syria, okay, to continue because these poor 30,000 with which he started the, the expedition, either were invalid or were wounded or were uh, dead. So he had to do this from a strategic point of view. It was necessary, although it seemed at the beginning as a delay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I need to thank this man because he's been the heart and soul of every event that we're doing. So, Bob, we are all very grateful for your help. Thank you. Thank you, Father Joseph. Thank you so much. We know how open and busy you are. Thank you for time, taking the time to come. Number three, Professor Postavides is accompanied by his beautiful wife, Vaso Polimeridu. They just came from Greece. And she's an attorney. And um, she, they've been traveling around the United States along with two friends, um, Costas Anastasopoulos and Senya Papadopoulou. Welcome. To St. Louis, thank you for being here. Um, our next event will be on September the 22nd. It will be the Catherine Pelican Lecture. And let me take this opportunity to offer to the Pelican family our condolences for the passing of Rena Pelican, whom we all love so much. And we will do also something to honor her memory uh, in, 